Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Hello. Welcome uh, to this uh, uh, conversation between artists and curators. My name is Paolo Colombo, and I'm the curator for the exhibition, uh, Gateway Exhibition Fragments Yesterday and Today. And uh, on my left uh, is Nima Nabavi, who I'll let, him let you introduce yourself. Uh, Hi hey everyone, my name is Nima Nabavi. I'm a artist. I work specifically in geometric abstraction and I'm an artist here represented by the third line in Dubai. Sarah? Um, hello, I'm Sarah Collins. I'm a senior curator in the Department of Culture and Tourism, um, by which I mean a museum curator. Mostly I have worked previously in museums rather than art galleries. Lamia? <laughs> yeah, okay, this is working. Um, my name is Lamia Gargash, uh, artist and fine art photographer represented by the Third Line Gallery. Hello. So <laughs> now we, you know who we are. I s presume that um, all of you have seen the exhibition. Um, and if that's a yes, uh, we can proceed really quickly. The exhibition is titled Fragments Yesterday and Today, um, simply because that's what it is. I think that art mm. is composed of a, a number of fragments, then even when you see a complete work of art by an artist, it is nothing but a tassel of a mosaic of a complete oeuvre of the artist. And likewise, uh, what we receive from the past and in our case, uh, they have been very generous loan from the Alain Museum, from Alain Museum. What you receive from the past is also tassels of uh, a history that uh, reaches us and we try to understand. Museums do that very well. They categorize them, they archive them, uh, they give labels to them. And in this specific case, we borrowed a number of works uh, which were uh, uh, archived, had been archived, and for which uh, 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 Sarah Collins made, w wrote wonderful um, uh, and very instructive labels. Mm -hmm. But we took the objects in, out of a museum and we placed them inside of a contemporary art context. Now the, the underlining thread of the exhibition is that uh, art is, um, is art, that any object, uh, when perceived uh, within the uh, art uh, uh, optics, uh, also acquires a value which is not necessarily a historical, um, descriptive value of a society, uh, that some of these objects we borrowed that happen to be 4,500 years old, and therefore, <coughs> go back, and I just want you to try to imagine what it must have been like to make a vase or a small fantastic stone uh, 4,500 years ago. And uh, some of the other objects which change, but not so much, at 70 years old, you recognize some bowls, especially a bowls for washing hands, um, that these anonymous vessels uh, are vehicles uh, of uh, uh, an aesthetic content and uh, of an artistic content, which we still perceive today, and uh, that can be echoed by work, by contemporary work. Uh, just to remind you a little of um, our um, of a work of uh, <coughs> the artist on my left. Uh, Nima Nabavi is a extraordinary um, uh, work on paper, uh, which is composed, I don't dare to ask, I, I guess over 50,000 lines. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't count them. <laughs> <laughs> he might have. Um, and uh, so you, again, exactly like you do when you see a vase so that's 4,500 years ago old, you try to imagine who made and how they were made. When you see a work of art which is contemporary, you likewise have to think that there's always a person behind. 
And in this case, specifically, a person which uses a very ancient craft, probably the uh, beginning craft, uh, which is a, a pen uh, and, and ink, uh, basically the, uh, a marker that goes directly from the hand to the, to the, to the paper. Um, it is something that, unlike paintings, I'm sure his hand had touched the paper all the time, <laughs> not only one hand, but the other hand mm -hmm. too. So there is a, it's a, there is a, a very intense uh, relation uh, with manuality. Uh, and last but not least, um, he knows his crafts very well. Uh, but I, uh, as I saw the piece, I shuddered at the thought that he could have dropped a stain of ink uh, <laughs> at the last line. Unfortunately, he didn't. Um, uh, Lamia Gargash uh, is an artist who uh, uses photography and uh, uh, in our cooperation, because this show, is, like all exhibition, is a cooperation with uh, Sarah Collins and the uh, museum in Alain, um, she was able to photograph the objects which we selected and that Sarah so generously made uh, sure we had. Um, uh, she's, she photographed these objects while they were taken out of the boxes and cleaned and analyzed and uh, condition reports were made. So she established um, a, a history of uh, the exhibition. While the exhibition hadn't even begun, begun uh, while the exhibition was in the making. Uh, so it is a completely performative act um, in linguistic terms. Uh, she, she created the exhibition even before the exhibition existed and she gave us a wonderful series of uh, photographs in which you will see uh, or you have seen the objects that are in, uh, in the exhibition. So these, this is a framework. Uh, it is beginning to be current practice um, to introduce objects of uh, other times, of other eras, uh, of uh, other media, uh, with the exhibitions of contemporary art. And I would like very much to ask uh, Sarah, who is at the heart of uh, this exhibition, uh, to, how, to know, ask her how she feels about this meeting of uh, uh, eras, of meetings of uh, artists, meeting, meetings between anonymous uh, and I think extraordinary artists with artists whom we know today who are as, as extraordinary. Um, and uh, what it means also in terms of exhibition. You know, exhibition changes. Uh, the, the worry of exhibiting work changes. We, we, we ask to borrow uh, mannequins <laughs> from, from the museum, uh, which is an older way to show, show work. So this exhibition sort of is a conflation of uh, many different ways of thinking of about art. And um, yes, well, um, my main project in uh, DCT is um, the renovation of the Elaine Museum. And uh, this museum was um, opened in 1971 and since then has been exhibiting the history of the UAE, so almost 50 years. Um, now it's closed for renovation, but there are objects from the Elaine Museum in various other venues, including in the Louvre Abu Dhabi and also in Qasr al Hussein. Um, generally speaking, I, I um, in my past I've been an archaeologist. Museum curators and archaeologists look at artifacts from the point of view of what they tell us about the past. And in exhibitions, that's a main focus of um, explaining the past, using the objects to illustrate. Um, especially in uh, ancient cultures where there's no remaining or no evidence of written word, you use the found artifacts um, discovered by archaeology to try to build up chronologies. To try because ceramic, fired clay is very enduring and survives and using uh, typologies of ceramics you can 
provide um, chronology for your archaeological site. Therefore, um, in museum curation, especially history museums, you tend to focus on what the object is telling you, whether it's giving you a clue about the time period, how um, you might imagine the object was used, um, and how it was made. But there's much less, or has been much less focused on the object as a work of art. And as you mentioned, the artists are anonymous, and their motivations are anonymous. But what we know of some ancient cultures, ancient Egypt, ancient Iraq, where there was writing, or where there's illustrative um, art, is that most works had a function beyond the decorative, that they were made to um, glorify the gods, or for ritual, or for some other purpose. However, it's a very um, interesting um, way um, to, uh, so imagine that you know, as a museum curator, you're trying to um, explain the distant past and make a connection, make people feel today why they should care about this. You sort of visualize every visitor coming to the museum with a thought cloud or bubble above their head which says, why should I care about this? And you try to provide different ways by which you can make visitors feel engaged with a time that was very long ago. One way is through art and contemporary and modern art. And in the, where I worked before in the Middle East Department of the British Museum, we felt this particularly strongly, and that's partly due to one of the curators, Venetia Porter, that some people might know, who was con collecting contemporary uh, and modern Middle Eastern art created by artists who very much focused on the importance of their past. But generally, in the British Museum, especially for special exhibitions, we were including, in, uh, for many years now, um, art, in exhibitions and galleries. So if you go now to the new Al-Bukhari galleries of the Islamic world, you will see an Idris Khan at the end. Who, he's also one of the exhibitors in this um, exhibition. And um, especially at the end of exhibitions, art was also often included to remind people of the relevance um, to the present day of either the subjects, themes, uh, images, and in particular, that artists found the past uh, inspiring for artworks. I had an easy time of this because I was the curator for ancient Mesopotamia, ancient Iraq, and there are a number of artists inspired by ancient Iraq on themes such as Towers of Babel or um, epic stories. In fact, uh, Salam Atasabri in this exhibition mm -hmm. Um, it was inspired by the Epic of Gilgamesh. So I would put some works, but they had in um, ancient, in exhibitions about the ancient past, but they had a very direct connection mm -hmm. to a theme or to an um, event or to a structure or something from the past. And often these artists were also making a statement about the situation today in those countries, which is also very good to remind people about. So from a point of view of museums that are about history, um, there are a lot of advantages in incorporating modern and contemporary artworks. Sorry, that was a long answer. No, it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful answer. I'm relieved. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that you f you you feel this way, uh, and I I can imagine Lamia because she uh, really um, is the bridge um, between the Alain Museum and this exhibition uh, has a number of thoughts about it. And um, for me, it was uh, I felt a deep connection with with the this the objects themselves, but also the act of preserving these mm -hmm. artifacts. Because my work is on the same line. It is about preservation, but it also talks about the human narrative and human experience. So um, to be kind of present in a more in a, a more modest setup with mm -hmm. these pieces was quite, for me, enrich um, was an enriching experience because I get to see them 
out of context from something that's a bit more elaborative and they're not you know standing so close to them and also being wary of their how their delicate nature um, it it did open up a new kind of world for me because I my understanding of conservation is quite limited but I feel that just those few times that I've visited I I've garnered so much information with regards to the importance of ma maintaining uh, maintaining these pieces and their and also their longevity and ensuring that they can live on, for, you know, and um, transcend down to future generations and um, and yeah. So for me, it's the narrative part that excites me. Is again, you have all these questions about where they come from and who are the people behind these pieces, and my work has always been about that. It's always been about questioning and it's always been about curiosity and it's also been um, it's about f being in the moment per se and the level of dedication and commitment and love mm -hmm. that's given towards all these artifacts is to me also quite romantic really mm -hmm. because you really need to be um, what's the word not just careful but really need to be in tune with whatever artwork you are f presented with and so, yeah, I guess being in that situation of documenting them, but also being in that context with them, I think, was quite surreal and quite enlightening. Thank you. Nima? Um, I think for me, what was really fascinating was that, you know, having worked with geometry, it's interesting. I was, I was inspired by my grandfather, who was also a geometric artist, and when I look at his work now, it's, it still holds up, it's not outdated. And, <laughs> and he would look even further for inspiration mm -hmm. and all the work he looks to is still not outdated. And, and in the years that I've started doing this work, I, I keep looking further and further back and, and geometry in this way um, has just been a universal human language. You go as far back as the cave paintings and you see spirals mm -hmm. and you see uh, waveforms and you see patterns always appearing mm -hmm. and and with the view I have on it um, the deeper you get into geometric art the, the weirder it seems that we ever even started doing this because um, geometry as it is doesn't necessarily represent an object mm -hmm. in the world it's seems to spring from something else. Mm -hmm. And for me, there's certain things that nowadays in the modern world, you can see a lot of um, representations of geometric shapes. It's, it's really easy, for instance, to explain to a kid what an octagon is because you say, you know, look at a stop sign. Mm -hmm. Or you could say, oh, these steps, they're all parallel lines. And it's mm -hmm. very easy to say that. But what I think about a lot with, especially the, the ancient artisans is, who drew the f first circle? Who came up with a spiral? Why a waveform? Where, where did these ideas spring forward? What was the imaginative space that they were in that they decided to get into these forms and shapes and geometries that we still mm -hmm. work on today? I still look at things from thousands of years ago, and I still don't know how they did it. Mm -hmm. And there's still endless um, pathways in this in this infinite early human language. So I think for me, um, being able to look a lot at the patterns that were on the, on the pots and um, the, the clay bowls and to see, you know, there's one with eight bands where that makes an octagon and you have things that waveforms appear a lot, concentric circles appear mm -hmm. a lot. And when I was conceiving of, of these ideas of what I wanted to work, work on, I was actually spending my summer in New Mexico, and, and over there you see a lot of Native American art. And it's very geometric, it's very different, but you know they would also have the same kinds of markings on their pots and um, ancient artifacts. So it, it is really a, an interesting headspace to get in to think about um, my own kind of imaginative process mm -hmm. in trying to conceive of, of these types of geometric um, artworks and to then see that you know as far back as thousands of years ago this the same level of importance was somehow placed on this um, shapes and um, figures and forms and angles that we're still working with today so 
Um, for me, that felt very rewarding to be able to try to tune in with um, what it was that these ancient artisans were also thinking and try to really um, you know, create that bridge through time and space of trying to, mm -hmm. to be where they were thinking. So it was, it was very rewarding, I think. It, 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 tiny curiosity, you're talking about concentric circles. And uh, um, uh, Sarah Collins pointed out uh, some very small, incredible concentric circles uh, that were uh, carved. Mm -hmm. uh, I imagine you explained to me, I'd love it if you explain to, to everyone uh, how these circles were made on these um, stone carvings, artifacts. Uh, from yes, well, th well, they are um, this soft stone which came from the region was carved in the Bronze Age, about 2500 BC to 2000 BC, um, into vessels which, to a certain extent, were functional, but we're not entirely sure because a lot of them were also placed in graves. Um, but the, at one time, the main decoration was circles, or double circles. Mm -hmm. dot, we call it dot in circle because there is mm. a dot right in the middle. But Analysis has sort of shown that from um, under scanning electron microscope and in other methods that the dot in the circle is, is deeply embedded, more deeper than that. And it was almost inevitable that these were made using some kind of compass-like tool to get these almost mm -hmm. perfect circles. And the, the middle part had received more, you know, uh, embedding Embraced. of yeah. a tool. So probably a compass was used, yeah. but but the the reason for the popularity of this design on those vessels at the time is it, we can only speculate on some other patterns, wavy lines, and and other things ca are sometimes thought to be attributed to um, the natural world. For example, snakes, which were a, a subject yeah, of interest and ritual at some time. But it's, as you mentioned, some of these shapes, um, especially geometric shapes, they're not in nature. They're not yeah. really, um, it's hard to imagine what inspired them. Um, yes. <laughs> also, but, but their simplicity, well, they're not in nature, but there was a certain geometry at a one point mm. of our uh, uh, culture. I'm talking about Egypt, I'm talking about uh, ancient Greece. Um, and certainly all the Arab, uh, Arab world, it, uh, it was yes. a super uh, interesting philosophical um, um, pursuit, pursuit. And, and I would say that um, also because so many of these objects, as uh, Sarah indicated, uh, had a function, but maybe they also had uh, like a spiritual function. Uh, they accompanied uh, people in death or in their graves, uh, that is certainly a, a possibly a, um, a function of them, but it's a function that makes it very similar to me to what art does. So I don't, see, I don't yeah. see that function as practical, but seen literally a, as a spiritual um, um, function that stands for something else, and which is one of the characteristics of art that uh, uh, the, the only art that would stand for itself is either a found object uh, or, uh, or a perfect copy. <laughs> uh, but going back again to the circle, um, and there, uh, here I confess my um, curatorial uh, uh, ignorance, uh, I had the pleasure visiting the fair to see uh, a number of drawings in a gallery from Jeddah the gallery was called Arthur, I think, A R T H R. Yeah, it's uh, Donald, Donald Donald work. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I yeah. forgot the name of yeah. the artist, but absolutely stunningly yeah. beautiful drawings made of concentric circles, yeah. which would have been incredible next to your thoughts. So one, oh, one discovers every day uh, uh, new work and and uh, um, and something else. But uh, again. This idea uh, that uh, Sarah uh, introduced that these objects had a sacrality, had a real, um, could have had a, like a further 
uh, impulse or uh, uh, would relate to something that is uh, uh, mysterious and for it really deals very much I think uh, with the spirit of art and I tend to see them not being a archaeologist nor an art historian <laughs> Uh, but uh, basically somebody who loves art and I entered it uh, through the side door and not through the front door of uh, um, a university uh, into art uh, was more uh, into appreciation I, I find, find these objects uh, absolutely fantastic whether they're 50 years old or 4,000 years old and I uh, it's uh, um, Probably it's a, it's not very correct thing, but it, it's difficult for me even to separate them from anthropo anthropological objects uh, or, or objects with anthropological use, as we have in in the um, exhibition. And all of these objects ultimately stand for something else. Uh, I, if I'm not incorrect, um, the wonderful necklace with the uh, Marie Therese Thalers and the coral uh, stand also in the, in the little envelope box for a verse of a Koran stand also for the status of a person who wears them also an indication of eventual religiosity also an indication maybe of place I, I don't know I, I don't know if coral I is something that is within the region uh, or maybe coming from far away but it, is, it certainly is an indication of somebody who had um, uh, contacts with uh, uh, other lands. And, and I think that is sort of what's wonderful about art and art objects, which each one, if you look at them, is like a boat you get into, and you really don't know where it will take you. Uh, a bit like um, if you play chess, uh, the knight, which goes too straight and then more diagonal, you don't even know if it goes left or right, and if it leaves on something, but I mean, it's one of the, things that uh, excite me infinitely um, about art. And um, uh, so I, I was actually uh, uh, extremely interested in working with these ancient uh, um, uh, objects, which it is a, a practice which is becoming more and more uh, popular, I think, and I think uh, um, what it what it aims at telling is that uh, uh, art is art, and it's not necessarily um, uh, determined by worth <laughs> or rarity, but rather by yes, please. I can I can I can't hear you very well. Can you speak louder? I'm sorry because it's. You're saying that art becomes art because it's chosen by curators. Um, well, uh, don't give me this responsibility. No, 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 it's just, <laughs> you know, there, there's so much art out, but it becomes important when it's mm -hmm. got chosen by someone and it's, it's seen somewhere. I, yeah, yeah, in a way, yes. But what I'm, um, what I'm saying is that art is, is a value which is attributed to an object independently from the intention with which this object was made. And uh, um, uh, granted, uh, I was given the privilege to, to curate a show here. Uh, what I'm simply saying is, is that in the choice of works, I try to construct a narrative. And yeah, that but because you have chosen this piece, it becomes more important than the other piece you left behind. Uh, not really. Yeah, but the other because this the other is not the only exhibition in the world. Yeah, but the other pieces are not shown by now, and maybe they never will be shown, but they are still there. Yeah, no, I know, I know they're still there. But, it, but what I'm saying is um, um, that the selection for this type of exhibition, at least in my heart, is not a selection of value of a work. Mm -hmm. it, it is a selection of works that function within a narrative. And uh, I was the first to admit my mistake. I should have had something else in the show. So it's, it, it deals with information you have. 
So I just uh, wanted to explain that there are other reasons as well when art becomes art. Me? I just wanted to interrupt a little bit. No, no, I'm glad. It's, yeah. um, art becomes art also through other people, not only because it's there. No, art, uh, uh, absolutely, but I think to some extent this exhibition wants to um, open the door to this possibility. That, um, uh, that anything can be art and uh, that uh, anything has its, uh, its value, uh, it's, it's not its price necessarily. Uh, and I think somewhere along the way we try to put together art from different times, from anonymous artists along with artists, art of artists we know, somehow to prove that art is, is, is art independently necessarily from fashion or, or um, uh, a curator selecting it. But I'm saying that the art is stronger than me. Um, well, if art is not be seen by someone, um, does it matter? Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> um, I thought this is why we are here, but uh, I don't want to interrupt you. No, no, but this is a big question because we're late. talking about art and, <laughs> and, 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 and uh, uh, okay, uh, maybe yes, maybe not. Uh, art can also be the, the, the issue of lore. Um, the greatest uh, Greek uh, uh, painter of ancient times was Apelles, Apelles and no, nobody has ever seen any of his works, and he's still considered the greatest of all painters. It's the best. <laughs> you know, what can I say? And uh, by the way, uh, a number of artists uh, try to, from the description, I think, uh, and I'm going back um, memories, but I think they were in the, in Lucian, in a, in, in a book by Lucian, uh, describing a book, uh, a painting by Pallis called The Calumny. Uh, and uh, uh, a number of artists made uh, uh, out of the blue paintings from the calumny by Apelles, Botticelli among them, um, which truth was naked, uh, 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 the, the evil world was a, had a strange cape, etc., etc. We still don't know, but we still think of Apelles as the greatest artist. And we had a number of endeavors, uh, all the way up to Zuccheri, to uh, to rep represent um, this ancient painting. So again, maybe already in the Renaissance, we're trying to mix um, ancient artifacts, at least the memory of ancient artifacts, uh, with art. Um, um, one one of the things that I wanted to ask uh, Lamia is. Um, Uh, you, you photograph the whole pro pr uh, uh, process and uh, in the process there was also the representation of something which ended up by being uh, the support for, for jewels and I'm talking about this wonderful head yeah. which um, was made by in the, how many years ago? Um, it was probably made in the early 1980s or late 1970s. Some yeah. of the mannequins that are in the LA Museum weren't necessarily there at the mm -hmm. beginning when the yeah. museum first opened. But um, mostly they're full size mannequins mm -hmm. that were made in the positions of uh, the task or um, what they were illustrating. So man at the well, lady at the mm -hmm. grinding stone. They, they can't be moved into another mm -hmm. position. For some reason, there was just one head and mm -hmm. one arm which was stuck directly upwards with jewelry on it. Moved it. But um, <laughs> in recent times, this is not generally favored as a method of um, supporting objects or um, providing information, even though it's actually very effective instead of using a lot of words, just to show someone doing yeah. something. She, she's very, uh, Moza, it's her name, yes. yeah. she's yeah. very much present in, in, in your photographs. Yes. yes, she was. She was quite captivating when I saw her. And um, the conservator, Michael, had said that she was Nubian, probably Nubian-inspired, mm -hmm. I think, uh, mm -hmm. maybe. 
But I felt that, again, something taken out of context and put into a different setting just uh, changes the message completely. I mean, the, the mannequin versus the, the pen and versus the, the vase and everything mm-hmm. else that was there. It almost, um, it's quite, it's, again, it's very different from a museum setting and very mm-hmm. different from, so being in that context, I felt that um, it humanized them in some ways. Mm-hmm. And I, I know that they are human, they are um, an extraction of our, hu- uh, you know, our history and whatnot, but it felt very, um, almost like you developed this deep connection with the pieces and the head was just there. So she was very demanding of mm-hmm. attention. Um, wherever it is I looked in the room, she was there. <laughs> and so she, <laughs> I always like to study the space that I, that um, I, I like to kind of take my time, just, just like the conservators do take their time with the piece, I also like to look at the space in which the elements are in and see how everything comes together to form mm-hmm. a narrative. Um, and yeah, she was quite, um, she really did ask for a lot of attention. She, I just, I, cl- I, I, I had to document her. She, she felt uh, integral in, in my yeah. research as well. Um, but again, like for me, just being there was quite humbling as well, because as a kid, I'd always wonder, wh- I, I loved history as a child, and I loved paleontology, and I loved mm-hmm. all that. And I was always looking out for, whether the pieces were, ex- any pieces were ex- ex- excavated in this part of the world, and I felt that there was nothing, and I was always questioning myself why. But then you look back into understanding that um, the region was quite harsh, and people had priorities in terms mm-hmm. of survival was number one, and basic necessities, and so even though it was a hub for a lot of, um, you know, in terms of history and religious experiences and mm-hmm. the, the political movements, you know, survival came first and mm-hmm. so they a lot of these wonderful pieces probably never got to see the light and so um, again I mean for me this is just again very exciting to see that there's this whole new movement to awaken mm-hmm. these dormant pieces of history and to find out more about um, our I guess evolution I guess uh, our background stories mm-hmm. it, it's also quite interesting because um, these uh, objects that were supporting or mounts for objects mm-hmm. or plaster people that were illustrating um, narratives um, as time goes on and they become historical so they should really now this head and arm should be registered in the museum collection now Mm-hmm. It wasn't, pre- they weren't mm-hmm. previously. They were part mm-hmm. of the supporting scenery. Mm-hmm. But they are like sculptures. And so now this one has been lovingly conserved <laughs> and, and has, you know, featured in another exhibition before going into the storeroom probably. But now deserves to be seen as a collection object in its own right. Yeah. And so through time, what we're seeing as the collection changes and what is is deemed to be historical is changing. Yeah. Uh, also, um, also have to say it's a proof again that um, uh, there's very humble forms of art. In this case, it was uh, probably not considered as an object of art. Mm. Uh, over the years, it has acquired a, a number of values, which are historical values. Certainly, is a testament of uh, the museum practice of uh, 50, 60 years ago. Um, but today, it is also, I don't know if you know the name of the person who made it, but it's also a, a work of art in itself. A very, it, it is a vehicle of, of a number of aesthetical values, which we see today because we have a little distance and we are not blinded by the present. Mm-hmm. And we actually see there's an infinite care in, in, in doing her, there's a, a character. It, it certainly, <coughs> uh, there was a time consumption. Uh, pretty much all of the artists in the exhibition um, have um, intensive labor, uh, manual labor, uh, relation to the objects and the objects themselves uh, are the fruit of in very intensive manual labor. I'm th- thinking of the inkwells, which uh, 
uh, and the pens and the carvings around the pens and the silver. Uh, uh, I think that at least in this exhibition, which does not have really many conceptual works of art or strictly conceptual works of art, um, it, it, uh, it, I think it functions to be with uh, uh, objects of uh, um, anci uh, ancient objects, which were really the fruit of manual labor. Mm. And somewhere along the way, it might be my, my um, uh, curatorial point of view, and certainly uh, the lady who in in inter interrupted me before is right, um, uh, that uh, yes, I do have certainly a leaning towards what I like, mm. <laughs> and I do like manual labor. Uh, I, do, I do like to see in art and recognize in art uh, uh, not just uh, the glimmer of an idea, um, but uh, a, a solid, uh, uh, solid work. Mm -hmm. in, in this sense, you know, so many of the ancient artifacts we borrowed are, uh, are the fruit of very, very, very solid uh, manual, manual work. Yeah, I think it's it's really fascinating, especially with um, when you look at the types of uh, tools available uh, at the time and the difficulty, and even you know just adorning these mm -hmm. pieces. That the level of effort it took to um, just adorn these things, objects that are going to be used in a functional way, and mm -hmm. and objects that I guess in, in the sense of the way we think of art now as far as like contemporary art or things that would be seen in the art gallery, mm -hmm. for instance, they weren't creating these works for that. These were mm -hmm. functional items that were um, presumably being adorned for, for a deeper gratification or a deeper kind of um, meaning or reason. So I think that that's what's, what's really fascinating to see that 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 effort was made um, to reflect what I think is, I have to imagine that there's a type of order, especially with the going back to the geometric works, I think that there's a type of order that early humans must have started to observe in the natural world, um, whether it's that the sun comes up and down all the time, that um, the tide goes in and out, the plants grow mm -hmm. in this particular way. I think that, and I think that with geometry, it, you see that there's a focus on symmetry and order. And the I geometry of the stars. Absolutely, the geometry yeah. of the stars. Yeah. Um, I, I have to think that the, the sun and the moon, just the, these two perfect circles mm -hmm. that dominated so much of of early life mm -hmm. as far as I presume the contemplation mm -hmm. of the role of these two mm -hmm. heavenly bodies. Um, I think that that's where, where everything must have really started because you have these perfect circles. And I think, um, you know, we were talking earlier and I think so, I think Sarah had mentioned that um, sometimes we don't know where these shapes like the waveforms come from, but mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's interesting when you, for me, like when I work within geometry, there's certain phenomena that appear mm -hmm. that um, it's very difficult to understand why it appears in that mm -hmm. way. So an example I make is that, for instance, if you have a, a perfect circle and you take perfect circles of the same size mm -hmm. and make it so they're touching and go, going all the way around mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So if you take six Durham coins and you put one in the, one in the middle and six on the mm -hmm. outside, mm -hmm. all of them will touch. Mm -hmm. the, it's what's Everything. called like kissing circles. So it'll always be six that goes around mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. And this is, it's just a phenomena of circles. It's just the way it is. It's mm -hmm. always that way. There's never a time where you could fit eight around it. So there's so many phenomena like that in geometry mm -hmm. that it seems that once you start going down a particular path. Mm -hmm. So if you, have a, a, if you have a circle and it opens up this way, then mm -hmm. that becomes a waveform. Or mm -hmm. um, even the way 
waves work are essentially spirals that are moving forward. Mm -hmm. And then you look at it from this angle and they, mm -hmm. they are a wave. So all of these forms are interconnected. And I think that once you start traveling down that mm -hmm. path, mm -hmm. and I think that's why all these cultures end up with the same forms, yeah. essentially, is that there is a, a central form. And, you know, like a, a square doesn't appear in nature, but as soon as you start building shelters and realize like this is the form that holds up the roof. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I think that these things ju are just essential parts of yeah. the mechanism of the universe. And partly that, and partly, you know, simple forms uh, stay forever. Uh, as soon as soon as, uh, um, uh, as soon as the first hammer was invented, uh, let's say, I don't know, Sarah, how, <laughs> how, how, how far when back? When was the first <laughs> yeah. hammer invented? How I don't know, Probably how far back should we go? Age. Stone Age. I'd imagine a it stone it hammer. Yeah, it still has <coughs> not changed very much in shape. Yeah. Uh, s uh, certain elementary utensils have not changed very much. But anyone would like to open it to more questions and answers. Uh, just, just for the sake of it, he mentioned the number six, which is my favorite number. Mm -hmm. It was all apparently the favorite number by Pythagoras uh, yeah. because uh, the way to, ha to obtain the number six, um, or the number six can be divided by three numbers, which is one, one two, two, and three. three. And uh, uh, if you add one, two, and three, you have six. And if you multiply one by two by three, uh, uh, you have six. So I it's, um, again, certain things never change. Absolutely. Yes? Uh, you said there was a remark. So yes, yes, yes. Waving. Um, thank you very much. We can hear you. Great. So thank you very much. Um, that's been extremely insightful, and I do enjoy that um, rather different perspective. Um, what the gentleman said about, uh, I just wanted to add, uh, why certain uh, shapes have, have remained or became the sort of de facto standard. I think there's, and I agree with you there, but just to add, there's plenty of examples in nature. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, obviously uh, our ancestors were uh, sacrificing and, and had to survive and eat. And I, I think flowers represent a perfectly geometric example. Absolutely. I mean, I've been fascinated um, by um, never been interested very much in plant biology, going way back, but flowers are very beautiful, and they're extremely symmetrical, and they, they sort of encompass all these things about arrangement of petals, sepals, and the center parts, whatever you call them. Again, when you look at, say, honeybees, so our ancestors would have found honeybees, honeycombs, and they're extremely s sort of geometrical. Um, uh, tree rings, uh, perhaps some um, sort of fungi, mushrooms, Absolutely. the way they grow, roots. Um, and not to mention animals, which they'd cut open, but l looking at, say, the hard keratinized elements of, um, of, <coughs> of their um, uh, structures. Uh, they had certain waveforms. Um, I'm talking, say, sort of antlers and, and what the old aurochs had, because the animal kingdom has evolved considerably. So they had very um, uh, geometrical forms and, and some form of symmetry which they must have uh, copied and observed, along with, of course, the much larger celestial bodies. Again, Absolutely. water droplets dropping, um, and they create perfect concentrical co circles, which disappear slowly, and possibly we may, might have got those demi waves or that structure from there as well. Just something thinking yeah, along. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, I think one of the things, even when I was thinking about um, trying to put myself in the, the state of mind of a lot of these artisans that were using these forms, I think, I think in a certain sense of, like today, we don't have the, the same type of curiosity <coughs> about the basic goings on of the natural world. I think that most of our uh, immediate needs are taken care of. We order food and we breathe air and we use bathrooms and we get water when we want and we can control weather. And so I feel like, to your point, I think that the sense of urgency um, maybe not sense of urgency, but the sense of importance to try to figure out why and what is this thing. And, and there, is, there is absolutely um, an order to even the, um, the things that don't even decay that a lot of people seem to think of geometry as just like a visual perfection. And people always ask me, well, if the world's all geometry, then why do things decay? And that's not perfect. But those are also, layers and layers of geometry decaying in one geometric form 
at a faster rate than the than the growth <laughs> form is happening. So I think the more you look at it, and, and when you look at things like quantum mechanics now, and, and even if you look at the movement of molecules, they, they kind of match the movement of the planets. I mean, there is, I do think that, um, and this is not <laughs> scientifically backed necessarily the way I'm, I'm phrasing it, but I think that there is just a fundamental structure. There is um, the fab fabric of reality tends to have certain um, metaphorical echoes that we see in the world. And I, and I do also think that early man potentially without um, all of the distractions that we have in our everyday life, I do think that there's a possibility that they were receiving visual information differently. I think that maybe they saw magnetic waves. Maybe they had a different way. Maybe there was things that they picked up on the way that different animals in, in nature are able to pick up on things. Maybe they had a sense of when danger was around the corner. Maybe there was waveforms that they could see. I don't, I don't know, but I, I do think that these things are, are really kind of um, it just seems to me that way that they're just fundamentally built in to this this universe that we're no, no, in. Uh, they are, and it's actually scientifically proven. So complex shells, like say snails, and our ancestors mm -hmm. would have picked up snails and th that sort of structure yeah. uh, going deep into the sea. The nautilus, which is beautiful, yeah. if any if you have seen a nautilus shell, that's actually been modeled mathematically. Again, floral growth. So Absolutely. these yeah. can be described with a very advanced mathematical formula. Yeah. So there's absolute symmetry there, which yeah. can be modeled to a particular formulaic interpretation. Yeah, so absolutely. Uh, you're absolutely correct there. Great, I like being correct. But essentially, throughout time, and to make a mm. connection with the past, some of these things seem to be a basic human. We're attracted to certain shapes, designs, and patterns, mm. whether there's a logic to them, whether we really need them on our artifacts, um, they're pleasing to the eye. And, and again, in, if you can try and, and um, connect people to the past in that way, through, even through basic shapes, you're, you're immediately bringing the past um, from the far distance more towards you and, and enabling people to think about how they how they might relate to be how they might not be so different from people who lived thousands of years ago or even in the you know a hundred years yeah. ago. Uh, my my question is related more to the archaeology, if you allow me, and specifically to Sarah. I remember when I visited the museum of Alain years ago, like four, when he was part of the Art Dubai programs. And I remember I had a nice memory about a kind of new reconstruction of the museum. So I'm not aware what have been the changes in all these times. But taking your words when you say that sometimes you have people asking themselves uh, why I have to review this past, why, why I have to be in this position. I am um, worried about all these new technology uh, technological languages, diverse languages, and where we are living now, and especially the new generations. I was hearing you and thinking in all these similar pasts where nature, geometry, all the m marvelous art craft and arts are similar from one continent to other. And I was just seeing everything either black and white or terra or monochrome, in a, in a kind of most of them monochrome landscapes. So I'm just having some ideas about how could be interested to exchange somehow these new languages or the appetences or the taste, the, the, the new preferences of the new generations in order to re revitalize those uh, landscapes that are monochrome and all. Otherwise, I don't think that we are interested in that, and we are defending that. But what about those who come behind us? So my question is, is there any changes have been produced in you as a creator of archaeology and as well as a contemporary creator, I believe, if I'm not wrong, that can approach those new generations to the museum or to uh, the archaeological uh, 
landscape that you are taking care about? Is there some people that can make this more interactive mm. in order to be more uh, appreciated and more digested for the new people, the new generation? Yes, it, it, well, it is a big challenge um, these days. People expect um, a, a wider variety of interpretation of the past or of artifacts, um, partly due to, you know, there's, you can do, so, there's so much digital, uh, the at everyone's attention span is really fast. Um, there's a whole generation of, of visitors to places who are very interested in photographing themselves in those places more than perhaps <laughs> concentrating on what, what you've come to. But you have to think, um, you have to sort of try and get a compromise and also remember what's the unique experience that you can get by going to a museum to, to see actual artifacts which however good they might look digitally on your laptop or computer or in a game, um, there's something unique to be had about the experience of seeing them face to face and in the setting of a museum. So you don't necessarily want to make museums seem like uh, immersive game experiences um, to keep some distinction uh, about them, but this is a very big challenge now. There are so many different modes of interpretation and designers um, of exhibitions who, who would like to um, have all kinds of special effects. Partly, uh, it does depend if you're doing a temporary exhibition or a long-term uh, galleries in museums because things that become dated very quickly, you don't want to put in, in galleries that, that perhaps you're not going to change for many years. So when you look now at the displays of the Alain Museum and people go, ha, look at those mannequins, and it's so old fashioned, that will happen to whatever you do in the museum. A few years from now, people are gonna be looking at that and saying that kind of thing. So you have to try to find a way that you choose uh, ways to, present artifacts that are not going to instantly become outdated, uh, that are suitable for all kinds of people because your audience is varied. And it is very much a challenge now because of the higher expectations of having an experience when you go to a venue. But I think there are still very unique aspects of museums and one of them is to have the actual artifacts um, which are there real, not on a screen. This question really inspired me to think about Lamia, and I just wanted to ask her about the photography that she did. And, you know, you work with a lot of different cameras, you work with digital, but, but your print, I mean, y the works that you print are always analog, but I know that you take with your iPhone, I know that you have, you know, other mechanisms, and I just wonder, in terms of talking about documenting the space, can you talk to us about the types of cameras that you used and the types of ways that you wanted to present seeing what you saw while you were there? Um, so, um, I do work digitally, but my main focus is analog, and so it's definitely, definitely a longer process and a bit more challenging in terms of getting the films and getting the, um, you know, and I have different cameras with different formats and it, I, I work with a lot of different cameras on site. So I would set them up and uh, somehow the space speaks to me. So then I would identify whatever my subject is with a certain camera. Um, and the process is quite tedious and long, but I find that especially with this project, it really served it well because um, the whole process of conservation is being in the moment and being very kind of uh, poised and being very um, wary of your surroundings. And I had to be extra careful on site as well to ensure that whatever I brought in was not, um, did not uh, in some ways affect the artifacts at, you know, at, at hand and being also wary that I couldn't bring in lights and I couldn't. And so, um, so working with this kind of limited frontier, I, I felt that it was a challenge, but it also gave me, um, in some ways, I, I did find an instant connection between the act of conservation and what I did, because my work is also quite, in some ways, outdated. The process is quite, it's much slower, and um, it, it does take a longer time for me to take a picture, whereas with, a, you know, 
with my digital cameras, they're more or less as, I, I consider them my backups. I consider them as um, secondary um, and film comes first. Um, and I've been working with that specific format for over a decade and all my studies have been conducted in the same manner. Um, and just like Sarah said, like we live in a world that's so fast paced that um, you kind of forget, you overlook a lot of your surroundings and you forget about the experience. And museums are at the core of human narrative and the human experience. And um, my work also entails that. It talks about appreciating the many things that we overlook, uh, you know, the mundane and the space. And um, I believe that as a culture changing, our changes happen within <coughs> space and within the elements in space. And as we move, move on with life, these, these elements and compositions say different, you know, can speak volumes decades down the line. And so, um, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, I do work with a lot of different formats and link them according to the subject that I'm shooting. I have questions to, uh, one question to artists. Um, how different did you see your own work being exhibited along other works in the space? Uh, every one of you and your um, colleagues in France, they uh, work with different media, medium. And uh, I also, I guess, I, I when one creates an artwork in his space, being inspired by the past, you are set in your own kind of mindset. And when you are together in one sort of enclosed space, did you have any discoveries about your own work and how it might speak differently to the public uh, and to you as well? So okay. don't mind yeah. sharing, um, thank you. I think one of the things I think about a lot is that my work is, is basically craft. I, I don't really, I don't think, <laughs> I mean, it, it's shown in places where fine art is shown, but I really see it as a, a continuation of, of craft work. It takes a really long time. I, I deliberately um, don't do digital work uh, as a type of shortcut. I kind of go through the whole, like Paolo said, the whole manual labor part of it, and it is, um, it can be quite difficult just mentally getting through something that's so arduous and also <laughs> physically it's, it can be backbreaking work. Um, so I really, I, that's why I, I really like having it um, alongside a lot of the archaeological work because that to me is so fascinating. Like I said, there's no reason to adorn this thing in that way. There's no reason. They just did it because <laughs> that that's what they wanted to I mean that's where it really intrigues me is like the why of it all and I think it's easier for someone like me to say well it's it's my job it's what I I'm supposed to do but um, I really do I think that maybe with it being exhibited in that kind of space it it, it did first of all make me want to bring the best possible work I could do because I felt like you really had to be respectful of the, the ancient work that was there and the, the people that broke their back to, to make this inkwell have this waveform on it. And a lot of the work is, is pristine. I mean, it's just amazing. They could have gotten away with putting like two lines on it and they just went the extra mile. So I think um, in that context, I wanted it to be something that, that I'd feel happy for it being there. Um, at the same time, with a lot of my contemporaries too, I think that um, I knew Lamia was working on on something, but I didn't know what it was going to look like. And and having thought about my work for months and trying to do it, when I saw her side of it, or even um, hearing um, Sarah's perspective or Paolo's perspective on it, it really is rewarding to think that everybody was trying to figure this story out from different angles. And I think that uh, part of, I think, what Paolo was trying to do in curating the show is, can we approach this, the, the, the decoding of the human story in a, in a different way so that people from different 
um, vantage points or filling in some of the I don't know parts of the story? Like, the, can can everyone kind of pitch in and show it from different angles? And maybe this goes to your question as well of how do we get people interested in it? Is that if there's, I mean, in a show like this, there's something someone's going to like and that might lead them to the next thing and the next thing and get like a kind of an interesting story. So I, I mean, I, I think that I, I felt very proud of being involved in this show and I, it felt fun that mm -hmm. it felt like everybody had gone away and tried to put in their side of the story. And, and then when you see the whole thing together, it is, it does help you fill in the gaps of what you were thinking about the project as well. Uh, Lamia, would you like to add something to it? And I think after you, we're going to have to yeah. close the, the conversation. I just wanted to say that I, I, I work with um, documenting these objects, um, but coming into the space, I got so excited again because I felt like I saw them in a whole different light. The context of art really plays a role in the message, but also the dialogue that it forms. And I remember we were talking about the mannequin at the end, oh no, the Science. The robot at the, the entrance robot. in connection to the mannequin, and you mm -hmm. were telling me that, you know, there's, you know, it looks like a, it looked like a modern mannequin, but mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, there was a relationship that ar had already developed just by being in that space itself. So, um, I think wherever you put art, and it's always going to read differently, but it's always going to be a new experience. Um, at, at least that's what I felt um, yeah. as I walked into the space. Thank you, thank you all for coming. And um, I hope you enjoy the show if you haven't seen it. And I hope you see it again if you've seen it before. Thank you. Thank you.